Okay, so I'm Alex, I'm from New Relic. Uh, we are based here in Barcelona, and today I want to share a little bit our story of using Kafka Streams in production systems. So, I work in the cloud monitoring part that is completely built here in Barcelona, and if you squint about cloud monitoring, it's not that complicated, right? You have a cloud provider that uh, you have your application, and we basically do an HTTP request to fetch the metrics for all our clients. And these metrics we send towards a Kafka topic, and it ends up in our internal database. Not a big deal. Now, the architecture, as we did uh, of this project, is basically a task queue, uh, which means that there is a scheduler that knows when to push which jobs into the Kafka topic. And there is a worker that picks these jobs from the topic and it executes them. So what it allows us to do is to have multiple workers, obviously, that all of them are uh, separated and don't share anything. And they all pick up things from the Kafka topic and they execute the HTTP requests. Now the scheduler in this situation would be a single point of failure, so we fixed it, introducing several instances of scheduler. Each one of them, though, um, there is only one of them that is uh, scheduling things, and the lead election, the one that will be scheduling, is done through the zookeeper. So as you see, um, this architecture has several uh, key points. It's horizontally scalable um, in all the points, so we can add more workers uh, whenever we need uh, to bump the throughput. Um, we can it's stateless, meaning that uh, the worker shares nothing between them, and so it makes the horizontal scalability actually possible. Uh, it's fail-safe, meaning that if one worker dies, nothing happens. It's going to be replaced, and no data will be lost. If scheduler dies, nothing happened. The another one will be elected as a leader, and the work will keep flowing. And there are a few Kafka topics involved. Um, so. Uh, in New Relic, so it is happened that Kafka became a backbone communication pipeline for our backend services. So whenever we can allow the asynchronous uh, communication, there is normally Kafka in place. So when we are saying metrics, as um, when we are saying metrics, what we mean basically is that okay, so you have your um, Entity, it could be an EC2 instance and can be a Kafka topic and can be whatever. And it would have a timestamp, which basically means that we took the measurement at this point in time and it's going to be some metric. It can be CPU, number of partitions, uh, memory, what have you. And these metrics are arriving uh, in time one by one with some resolution. And all these metrics, as I said, we send towards an RTB. So uh, the from the storage perspective, uh, when you think about it, it's kind of, it becomes a little bit expensive to store all the data with one minute resolution. So at some point, uh, the normal request comes that you have to do the aggregation of the data. And to produce just, for example, for historical purposes, one event for an hour. In our case, it's gonna mean that we have to introduce state, which is something that we really didn't like to introduce because our system was perfect, it was architecture, it was horizontally scalable, everything was working. The state is the bummer, basically. Um, so the way we wanted to achieve it is whenever we have an architectural problem, we never end up creating a new Kafka topic. So in this case, we would listen to the one minute resolution metric topic, and uh, we would do the aggregation and we would send it towards a one hour resolution topic and it would end up in NRDB also. Um, we looked at several approaches of how you can do it, like the classical approach is to just do the batch processing. Um, in Eurelic, historically, batch didn't work very well. Whenever we do something in batch for the client data, we end up rewriting it in stream because of like the main challenge for us is the sheer scale of data like there's just too much data that we are trying to ingest and process so and the um, we have some requirements on the latency so batch approach didn't work well 
Local storage uh, is not an option because the worker will just, like if the worker dies, we lose the data of the client, which is not good. So like fail safe goes out the window and it was not an option. Um, the last um, resort of any architect is like summon Redis um, in case of the doubt. And this situation also couldn't help us because there was just too much data for Redis and we would have to go into sharding and partitioning and everything and this is not something that we wanted to do. So uh, we asked around in Neuralic to understand what other teams are doing because this is not the first time we're trying to solve this problem. Um, and the two answers we got was uh, Apache Flink and Kafka Streams that already were used by some teams in Relic. So both of these systems provide the exactly one semantics, which is great. It basically means that your message is guaranteed to be processed once and only once. Uh, both of them provide stateful local storage with this fail-safe mechanism, meaning that if your worker dies, the storage is guaranteed to be restored somewhere else, and so you're good to go. The difference started more on the operational side of the things. As I said, Kafka being the backbone of New Relic um, is being provided to us developers as a service, meaning that there is a special team that takes care of our huge Kafka cluster, and what we do is we just create pull requests there, requesting our topics with all the configuration that we need. And in case of a Flink, we would have to manage our own cluster uh, of Flink, which is for a small team as we are, is not something we prefer to do. And um, another big uh, difference between these two stream processors is the Flink is a framework. Flink brings everything with it. Um, you basically give it a cluster, like you give it the resources, and it takes care of networking, it takes care of storage, it takes care of scheduling jobs, of executing them, everything, everything. The Flink is the whole world. And um, in order to work with it well, you have to understand it. So it's, I think there's like, for us at least, there was a steep learning curve. Because as I said, we already knew Kafka, and uh, Kafka Streams is basically a library, a thin abstraction on top of the Kafka itself. So like no new concepts uh, have to be learned for us. Uh, when you introduce Kafka Streams library, so when you just work with Kafka, you have consumer and producer libraries in your uh, application, and you manage them by yourself. When you introduce Kafka Streams, Kafka Streams takes away from you the consumer and producer, and it gives you the abstractions like source and sync and all the tables and streams, and gives you the DSL to manipulate them. So from the operational perspective, we could use the same deployment mechanism, which was great, uh, and we could use, and like no new external dependencies would appear for us. Um, which basically means that we could go to production quickly. So now having like all the tools on, and we were ready to work with some state. So as I said, the project we were trying to tackle was the aggregation. Um, when you work with Kafka streams in your application and you start some stateful operation, like for example, aggregating the data, Kafka streams gives you an abstraction of store. And behind these scenes, this store is backed by the change log topic. This is the way Kafka Streams achieves this fail state storage, right? So whatever information is in your local store, it can be in memory or it can be RocksDB, will also be backed up to this Kafka topic. So the metric arrives with the max value of like 10 in this situation. We process it and we store it and it's automatically being sent to the changelog topic. The new one arrives, it's been updated. And by the end of the hour, we produce the last metric that we saw. When you need to bump up uh, the throughput because you need to process more things and you add more instances in place, what will happen, Kafka will give each of these instances its own store, it's local, but it's also gonna create underneath 
three, in this case, partitions of the changelog, each one for its own store. Since using the magic of consumer group, all the things are being united in like one consumer group and they're consuming from the same topic, if one of them dies, it's not a problem. The, to the partition that has been lost will be picked up by the uh, by some other instance and he, the store will be migrated to this instance. So this instance will just read everything from this Kafka topic that he saw by the time and it will be ready to start from the same point when the previous instance died. So in case of the aggregation in this project, what we got basically was the key value storage. If you think about it, it's, it could be a generic key value storage, like you can use it wherever you want. Not, as, like not only the way that Kafka gives you it automatically, but also like if you do custom transformers, you can use the storage. Uh, we got for free time window calculations, and uh, uh, this is something that we really didn't want to do ourselves, uh, because time is hard. Like whenever you try to do the time window calculation, you find out that you just need to write too many tests in order to make it work. Um, you're, we got scalability with the number of partitions, and this is one of the key points of Kafka streams, basically that you can scale infinitely if you just add infinite number of partitions. Technically, there is a physical limit, I think, in the cluster, but um, I don't know which one it is. And as I said, we got a bunch of new Kafka topics. And this is a recurring topic. Okay, so this project was went quite well in terms that we were happy with the chosen technology, so we decided to tackle the next one. The next one was about data enrichment. Uh, in the old days, is basically when you have to go to look for the information in the database. Well, this is now called enrichment. So with AWS, the trick is that you always have several APIs. One API will give you the metrics, and the other API will give you what we call metadata. There'll be your region, your instance name, your instance type, what have you. And uh, what we wanted to do is basically to merge uh, two streams of data by the ID of the instance and produce just one. We need this in order for our clients to do the search and the faceting and the slicing and dicing of the data so they can search, for example, for all the instance in a U or all the instance that has the name X. Um, when you think about this problem, like, okay, so in the, in the days of the database, you just go to the database and pick up things. If things do not work well, you add a cache here and there. When you're in the stream business, uh, what you have to do, if you have multiple partitions in each one of them, and you want to process them like with multiple uh, instances due to throughput, it basically means that the same, and the, what one of the key points here is that the partition key for these two topics is the same. So the instance metrics with the key one should end up in partition zero, and the instance metadata with the key one should end up in partition zero. Now the problem is that when you work just directly with Kafka consumers and producers, there is no control over which partitions are you consuming. They are assigned randomly. And so what end up doing, what end up happening is that your metrics go to one instance and your metadata goes to another instance. So the merge cannot happen. You're just unable to do it. Now the trick that you can do is basically you can read all three partitions from the metadata topic in each one of the end of the instances. It brings all sorts of problems, like for example, lack of memory and scalability issues. And also the problem that we saw is the startup time in this situation of your service can go to like minutes because you need to recuperate all the metadata for all the entities, for all the clients into one instance. So from the scalability perspective, it's not very good. 
Now, the only magic dust that Kafka Streams brings into the game is called cop partitioning. Uh, what they make sure is that instead of that you have to read all the partitions um, of the metadata in this case in order to merge to, to work, they basically take control of it and they say, okay, if you have the same partitioning key and you have the same number of partitions, we're gonna make sure that this instance will subscribe to partition zero of topic one and partition zero of topic two. And so the match can actually happen on this. And you don't have to read all the metadata in memory in order to do it. Which is exactly what we needed to do. So as I said, the The, um, so in order for this magic to happen, you have to have the same partitioning key, you have to have the same number of partitions in each topic, obviously, and you have to have the same hash function of a producer. And this came as a little bit of a surprise. So in our system, in our infrastructure, we have Java application and Go application. So in this case, Java application produced to the metrics topic and Go application to the metadata topic. Now what we saw, what we observed, that the message with the same key, for some reason, ended up in the different partitions. And so the Kafka streams being subscribed to partition zero, partition zero, were not able to do the match. Well, it turns out that according to the historical reasons, um, Java and Go libraries of Kafka use different hash function in order to know which partition to send your data to. And so it just doesn't happen. The way, but Kafka Streams is, is excellent. It helps you here. So what it does for you, it introduces the operation of repartitioning. So it's gonna take all your data that you have and it's gonna mm, repartition it with the correct hash function. And so your, fun so your metadata will end in the topic number zero as it's supposed to be. And so the match will happen. Now, as you see, uh, this, with, with this basically, we can do enrichment at scale. So just because we only have to read like one partitions from each of the topics, we basically can scale with the number of partitions. And uh, in case where you have problems or doubts, Kafka Streams will happily repartition all your data for you. Now, the only trick is that they're going to be a little bit more Kafka topics. Uh, with all the work done, we were about to get some rest, but then we understood that we need to deploy this to production. And this uh, was, for us, quite simple, because what we have is the Mesos cluster, and so we do the declarative deployment, we just say how many CPUs we want, how many memory, and how many instances of this. And uh, each one of our applications exposes a health check um, that basically says if the application is running or is not running. And there was the, and when the health check says that it's not running, of course, Mesos will remove it from the cluster and we're gonna replace it with a brand new that is much better. So in case of Kafka Streams, as I said, since it is a library, all the glue you have to bring by yourself. So like all the services starts and everything you have to do in your Java application. And with Kafka, you just start the stream thread and it goes on its own. Now the trick is that if the stream thread dies, well, your application thinks that it's all fine and uh, data just doesn't flow in. So in order to fix this situation, Kafka Streams exposes you the set of listeners that you can use in order to manage this situation. So in the normal state, uh, Kafka will be like a normal, a normal situation, the only state that you should be in is running. Now the problem is that whenever Kafka in, sees the error, it can go to the uh, erroneous state and it will never recover from it. If you don't listen to these state changes, you will not be able to detect that you're actually not processing any data. Another situation that we saw is that sometimes Kafka Streams application can do rebalancing, which is normal. 
But sometimes due to network flakiness, due to cluster unhealthy state, or due to Mesos interesting things, rebalancing can take a long time, or you just you're in the rebalancing loop. And in this situation, we alert, because it basically means that the data does not flow in through. And another set of listeners is uh, used to announce you how the state restoration is going. So as I said, um, when the application starts up, it needs to pick up the latest state it had from the Kafka topic. And this process, uh, in the normal situation, it just like uh, picks up several batches and then it goes to the end. Now the problem is that, for example, if you have too much state, you can stay in the batch restore state for like minutes at a time. Or if you have some partition that has much more data, it's gonna be feeling like the application does nothing because it just sits there and chewing CPU. Meanwhile, the data is not flowing. And so in order for you not to redeploy the application as I did, it's good to know that it's just restoring the batches. So uh, as for the metrics, these are the state listeners. As for the metrics that we are monitoring, uh, we always monitoring consuming and producing throughput and we alert on this because it basically means if your uh, processor is working or not. We also alert on missing joins. Um, so whenever the match of the metadata and metrics, for example, in our case, doesn't happen, it means that there is some data loss. It means that in some topic, maybe the partitions are not right. It means that something weird is going on. So we alert on this. And we also alert, as I said, on the rebalance loop because we found out that it could be tricky. Um, and apart from this, the metrics that we also monitor will be story-specific metrics. Mm, Kafka exposes tons of metrics for you, uh, but one that we found particularly interesting are, so each aggregation store, each store will report its size. So you can understand if, for example, your data is distributed uniformly or not, and uh, it helps you. And also we have a lot of business specific logic uh, metrics in there to understand if we actually, so okay, we're producing and we're consuming, but are we actually doing any work? Uh, so this is like a typical dashboard of our application. It's gonna be the latest states in the big letters so you know if everything is going well. There's gonna be a chart that shows like historical performance um, of this instance. Um, we're gonna see the throughput of producer and consumer here. Um, this will be the business metric. In this case, we are producing the reports, so we know if there's like a dip in reports, maybe we should alert on this. And these two charts represent the state restoration. So as you see, for example, for one partition, it took uh, four minutes to restore after one restart, which was not very good, and we had to work on this. So after tackling the deployment and everything, if you're successful enough, it is time for you to scale. As I said, Kafka streams scales with the amount of partitions. Um, the trick is though that having the managed cluster, we just cannot just add the partition by ourselves. So we need to create the pull request to do it. And also if you just create the partition, uh, the Kafka stream will die, for example, if it's trying to do the merge, because it's gonna say that in one topic there is four partitions and another three. So the way it should be done is that you have to shut down your Kafka Streams application, apply the change to your topics, and then turn it on. Um, and number of partitions should be the same. So in our case, it turns into a very interesting set of operations. So okay, we want to migrate from the topic with three partition to topic with four partition in this case. So first we have to create a pull request to the Kafka server to create these new topics. We cannot change the configuration of the topics as, the, as, as it is because we don't know when this change will be applied by the team that is managing cluster. So, and we cannot shut down Kafka streams for like hours. So first there's a PR with the new topics. Then there is a second PR for the one application to start pointing to the new topic. And there's a third PR for the second application to point to the new topic. Then we drain the old topics with the application and then there's the fourth PR that basically points to all the new topics. 
All of this to say that you actually, with Kafka streams, there's a tendency of doing microservices. There's a tendency of like having multiple Kafka topics here and there. And so runbooks and documentation is something I found very valuable in this process and something we didn't do very well, I should say. And another trick uh, that we found, or a rake, is that, uh, so imagine that you have a lookup operation in between of your topology. So the, the source on the top, the sync on the bottom, so the messages flow top down. And there's a lookup operation where you block for some reason. You go to the database, you do HTTP call, you do something. Well, it turns out that it's gonna block the whole topology. So like no work will be done. Even if your topology is huge and there is, could be some parallelization happened, uh, the nature of stream processing and the way the Kafka stream handles messages is top down, depth first. Meaning that they can, the, the, like, it picks the batch of the messages on the source and up until the last message of this batch leaves the sync, no batch will be picked up. So whenever you're blocking your operation, you basically block the whole topology and the data just doesn't flow. So it means that like one of the partitions or like set of partitions of your application uh, can have a significant consumer lag. So the lesson learned from this exercise were like we shouldn't block, which is obvious. If we block, it's better to do it in the separate service. Kafka streams really appreciate when you have a uniform topology. In this way, it can optimize the best way the throughput of your data. So if you have like a blocking call to some service, just take it out, extract it to a separate service and do it there. And uh, another thing is that it's better to distribute the load as uniform as possibly. So for your partition key, choose uh, something that is super granular. Like don't go with account IT because for sure there are gonna be a client that's gonna send you a bunch load of data and then just go explode one of your partitions and you will have to upsize just the whole infrastructure based on like one partition. Choose something smaller. We went with, for example, entity ID, which more or less are evenly distributed. Um, so as a summary, I'd say that we're quite happy. So we working with Kafka Streams for about a year now, our team, I mean. So far, we are still building the new services using Kafka Streams, which is good. Uh, it works reliably. Um, whenever you kind of start to understand how it works, it's just there crunching the data and you don't have to feed it. Um, it really helps to know the Kafka very well because everything is in topic. Kafka stream is beautiful, everything is in topic. But you really have to understand like how the topic works, like what is the timeout of the producer and why your application shows that it has a huge consumer lag, meanwhile it actually does very well. So knowing like the ins and outs of Kafka really helped us to work with Kafka streams efficiently. Um, I heavily appreciate that co-partitioning is the only magic dust. I've been traumatized by Ruby on Rails and I hate magic. And uh, the only caveat is that there are gonna be a lot of Kafka topics. And this is something you have to be very honest with, especially if you have a managed cluster and you have operational people. You have to honestly tell them that you, <laughs> you're gonna be created like probably duplicate and triplicate your data just because Kafka Streams creates topic for you. And you also have to watch really closely because sometimes just changing the topology a little bit, like thinking it a little bit forward, can reduce significantly number of topics that are being created. So watch it. And with this, I'm open for questions. Hello, thank you for the presentation, it was really nice. Uh, I have two questions. First one is about time. So when I try to implement this um, aggregations over time on a stream processing platform, uh, I had trouble with the API back then. Uh, I don't want to discuss the API because it probably changed, but uh, you were doing uh, aggregations on time 
which was time inside the events themselves. How was that as an experience? Like, was it, yeah. So right now, at least, we didn't have a problem. Uh, they introduced the timestamp extractor that basically you can say if you want the wall time, if you want the stream time of the event, or if you want like ingest time of the message. So now you can choose whatever time you want. Thank you. And the other one is repartitioning. So uh, if you work with MapReduce type of frameworks like Spark, that's my experience. Repartitioning is something that you want to do as, as, as uh, yeah, don't do as much as you can. Uh, and uh, you said that there will be a lot of repartitioning and that was from my experience uh, also something. How does that affect your cluster? How do you see that uh, in production? And yeah, what does that mean for your application? Okay, so as you said, with Spark, there's basically a shuffling, right? That you try to avoid as hard as possible. Like the beauty of Kafka is of Kafka streams is that uh, with Spark, sometimes I had a problem that shuffling just occurs behind the scenes and you don't know what's going on there. You just like the whole cluster just kind of go Boo. And uh, with Kafka streams, it's super explicit. So if it needs to repartition the data, it's gonna create the repartition in topics. So at least you know, it's like it's much easier to detect. Now, any, so this is still a problem in terms that whenever you want to group by things and process them, there are gonna be new partitions. It's unavoidable. And another down point, like we so far didn't do a lot of grouping, so we didn't have this problem. But for example, when I was also playing with this, I found out that for example, if your groups are not um, balanced, so for example, you do, I don't know, bank transaction success and failures, like there's gonna be 99% of success and like 1% of failures. And so if you do group by this operation, it's gonna end up in two partitions. And one partition will be just super small amount of data and then another one may be huge. And this is something that is still there in the cluster, but. And from the, how do we handle it? We handle it with care and love, basically, <laughs> to our operational team, because otherwise they're gonna prohibit us to do this. Uh, so we are super explicit in terms of like, how many data do we plan to add? Uh, what will be the throughput, like what will be the pattern of usage, etc. So far we didn't saw, like just because our cluster is enormous and uh, we didn't saw Kafka streams producing too many problems at this point. But also it's, I, like it's being used in just several teams here and there. Like it's not company-wide solution right now. Other questions? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I have a question regarding state uh, restoration. Uh, did you uh, experiment with a uh, number of standby replicas property? Uh, and how did that affect your processing latency and state restoration process? Right, so this is something we want to try. The trick there is that we have, uh, normally we have a lot of partitions. <laughs> and so, I don't, like, I didn't look into how actually, like, okay, so if you're gonna s do, like, one standby replica, if it actually gonna help. So if you do the repartitioning, like, what is the chance that this um, instance gonna pick up exactly these partitions? So it's something I want to experiment with exactly to minimize the number of, like, the duration of state restoration. But... So normally what we see, the state restoration problem is during the restart. So it's not so much as the repartition, it's like when the restart happens, you just have too many things, for example, in one partition due to imbalance that it has to pick up. Thank you. More questions? Hi, yeah. I've got a question regarding the um, <clears throat> trying to replicate or create new environments. So the issue is something might occur within production and you want to reproduce it. How many different environments do you have at least in some way to test something or introduce a new feature? How's the infrastructure being taken care? Okay, um, so in general we have production environment and staging environment and they are, like, they are the same. 
meaning that they're going to be the same configuration of all the topics in both environments. Uh, the data amount obviously will be different. Uh, we do not ingest uh, clients' data into staging. Um, but since basically, so our infrastructure is Mesos cluster, right? So we're declarative, meaning that we just have a YAML file and things are being created for us. We have another one, YAML file and topics are being created for us. So the only thing we actually need to do uh, is like deploy our application whenever uh, we need it to be. So for us, like we as the company, for example, we are doing the disaster recovery once a year. And uh, so we practice this uh, restoration quite often in order for it to be efficient and work well. <laughs>